we are talking about the trauma diamond of death. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Just giving blood products is not the only piece of the answer. We're, yeah. we're balancing and juggling a lot of different aspects of the patient's care to make sure that we can actually get the bleed to stop. Yeah. It's not just putting pressure on it or sending it to the OR. There's a lot more to manage as, mm -hmm. as a trauma nurse. The components of the diamond are hypothermia, coagulopathy, hypocalcemia, as well as acidosis. And they all directly or indirectly work with each other. You have to understand how all of it works together. And not only, like you said, we're not just gonna be stopping the bleed and dumping products in. We wanna be able to look at those components individually mm -hmm. so we can help support our patients individually with those components to eventually stop the bleeding itself. <laughs> well, welcome back to the Rapid Response Run Podcast. I have joining me once again, Sarah Vance, my fellow nursing educator. Today, we are talking about the trauma diamond of death. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and MTP, or Massive Transfusion Protocol. So Sarah, welcome back to the Thank podcast. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. So glad to have you. So last week, we talked about trauma, how all the different body systems kind of work together, but in treatment sometimes work against each other. You know, I always think of trauma as like blood and guts, but this patient from last week, it wasn't really blood no. and guts. It was more like neuro and respiratory. This week we're talking blood and guts. Blood so and guts. blood. So we're gonna talk about the trauma diamond of death or the lethal diamond, it's called lots of different things, and then massive transfusion protocol. Because treating trauma patients is so much more than just dumping a bunch of blood and then to replace blood loss. It's also a whole metabolic cascade that we have to get a handle on. So, Sarah, before we dive in, for those that haven't listened to the last episode, can you just tell people who you are, what you do in this world, and why you love talking about trauma? Sure. So... Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm Sarah. I am a critical care nurse educator. Um, I've been a nurse in critical care areas for about 14 years. And I also have a business, icunurse.com. And I basically help um, empower nurses through education and mentorship that are going into critical care areas. Yeah. So you take from what I have observed, very challenging concepts and make them make sense. Yep. That's like your, my motto. It's your, it's your superpower. Make it make sense. Yes. <laughs> I, love it. I love to just take them and you know, really simplify them so you can grasp the concept and then be able to apply that to what you're seeing on your patients. Yeah. And the concept we're talking about today, prepare yourselves, is going to be a deep dive in the pathophys. And so Sarah's the perfect person to break all this down with me. So Sarah, this particular case, can mm -hmm. you just walk us through the patient that you cared for, what brought him to the hospital, and then what did he present as whenever he showed up in your unit? Sure. So this patient was multiple gunshot wound to the abdomen. They stabilized him somewhat in the ER. So they did rapid infuser MTP in the actual um, ER bay, the trauma bay, but he emergently had to go to the OR because he was just bleeding out. Um, in the OR, they ended up repairing a splenic, um, his splenic artery as well as his mesenteric artery were injured. Ooh, and they big also, bleeders. big bleeders, big arteries, right? So massive blood loss. Um, so they did a few rounds of MTP on this patient. Um, I think total, he had roughly all said and done about 80 products total, which is a lot. Yeah. Um, and then he also came, they did a Obviously, they had to do an open belly um, where they did part of a bowel resection as well. So when he came to our ICU, he was kind of that like stable, unstable situation. Like he was still actively being resuscitated. We, he was still volume down. He was still depleted. Um, but he was on pressors. He was intubated, had a wound vac on the abdo abdomen area. He did have some drains. Um, initially, his blood pressure was okay. You know, like it was okay. And then he tanked again. He started having a large amount of output out of his wound vac. Um, cause even though they took him to the OR and did some repair, that doesn't mean that it's just going to continue to be okay. Um, so we did another round of MTP in the ICU actually. And he ended up, you know, his bleeding did stop. He did go back to the OR and he did bet he did. Okay. Got extubated and everything, but yeah, 80, 80 units of blood products. That's a lot of donations from yes. the community. Yes. <laughs> That's a lot of blood. Okay. So when we say a round of MTP, yep. what does that actually mean? So typically a round of MTP, um, every hospital is going to have their own unique kind of protocol, but you're going to be looking at a one to one to one ratio. So when we dive into MTP, which we will in a little bit, um, you want to make sure that you're not just giving pack red blood cells. So it's a equal equivalence of pack red blood cells 
FFP, and then platelets. So one to one to one. So around for us at my specific facility is six units of packed red blood cells, six of FFP, and then one five pack of platelets, which allows it to be a one to one to one. Gotcha. Or one six pack, I should say, of platelets. Yeah. And that's a very important concept to understand because I think we see all the red on the floor and we think, oh my gosh, we got to get some packed cells. But they and you'll hear more about it, they definitely need clotting factors yeah. as well. They definitely need the plasma as well, not just the the trucks to carry the oxygen, the red blood cells. They also need like the other very important components of the blood. Okay, so this guy had MTP not just once, but several times Most you had to activate, activate it yeah. and get those blood products in, which seems like that should fix it, right? You're losing blood, we'll just give you some back. But as you'll learn with the trauma dot... <laughs> <laughs> the trauma diamond of death dun, dun, dun. <laughs> thank you <laughs> is that it's way more complicated than that yeah so sarah if you will walk us through like what are the components of the diamond mm -hmm. and how do we address each one of them sure so the components of the diamond are hypothermia coagulopathy hypocalcemia as well as acidosis. And they all directly or indirectly work with each other that basically, if we don't take each of those components and look at them individually, it will just contribute to more hemorrhaging. Right. And that is our primary goal, right? Is to stop the bleeding. Stop the bleeding. Yep. But we don't just replace it with other stuff. We have to, you know, look at other factors. Okay. So start us from the top. Yeah, so hypothermia, okay? So how do we get hypothermic in a trauma patient or someone who is bleeding? So hypothermia can happen because we could have external blood loss. So for instance, him, he is he has gunshots, right? So he is externally bleeding. Um, and our blood volume that circulates does keep us warm. So if we're losing that blood volume, then we're losing body heat. In addition to that, you could have environmental factors that are contributing to hypothermia. So if you're outside, that could be contributing to it. But for him, him, like he was in the OR. We all know that ORs are very cold. So that right there is going to contribute to his hypothermia. So how do we take that component and how does it work with the other ones? So hypothermia slows down the metabolism of our liver being able to truly metabolize citrate, which we will get into where citrate is in blood products um, and how that ties into the whole component of what we're talking about. Um, in addition to that, it does interfere with the optimal function of the clotting cascade. So we know that that's a problem. If we don't fix hypothermia, it impacts coagulopathy, acidosis, hypocalcemia, all of those things indirectly or directly. So we have to take care of that to help our patients stop bleeding. So what we typically do is we want to control the bleeding, get him out of an area that is, if possible, that is cold and contributing to it. But whatever volume that we're giving, we want to make sure that that is warm volume. We're also going to be doing things like bear huggers and turning the room up. So I don't know if you've ever been in a trauma bay, but they it's are hot. <laughs> hot. So we want to do the, those things to help with that hypothermia. Okay. So the first point on the diamond is hypothermia. Yep. We got to warm this patient up or it's going to keep cycling in the wrong direction. Correct. All right. What's the second one? So the next one that we kind of talk about is coagulopathy. So our patients are not only are they losing clotting factors because they're bleeding out clotting fa factors, but, you know, if we're giving volume like crystalloids that can also dilute out their clotting factors. But we also know that um, clotting factors are going to be impacted again by, by hypothermia by acidosis and by hypocalcemia. So all of those will contribute to the body's ability to truly clot um, intrinsically, but we also have all the other factors that I just stated, like hemodilution, we're losing blood, we're losing our clotting factors that also contribute to that. So again, something we gotta fix. So our patient can't have poor coagulopathy, right. they'll just keep bleeding. So what do we do? Well, kind of like what we talked about, that's why that one to one to one ratio is so important because we wanna give them packed red blood cells. We wanna replace that, right? But we also are gonna be giving FFP and we're also gonna be getting 
giving them platelets. And then eventually in their resuscitation, we are also going to be drawing a lab value called a tag. And that tag will be spun out in lab. It takes a little bit of time, but it tells us specifically what the patient may need. So do they need more FFP? Do they need more platelets? Do they need cryo? What of the clotting or do they need red blood cells? But what do they need for us to be able to support them with the clotting cascade so they can stop bleeding? Right. Very good. All right. So we have a patient who's cold. We have to warm them up yeah. because if we don't, they're going to keep becoming more coagulopathic, yep. which is going to keep them being colder and colder. Like it's just a horrible set. Yep. They we're keep only, bleeding. And we're they only keep two points blood. in yes. to the diamond, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, we have to keep them warm. We have to replace their clotting factors. Those mm -hmm. are the first two. Okay. What's the bottom piece of the diamond? So if we look at how hypocalcemia, and so hypocalcemia is actually becoming more and more prevalent in the conversation related to MTP and uh, damage control resuscitation. So typically, or in the past, it may have been referred to as the triad of death, where it wasn't really talked about. But now there's more and more literature coming out that talks about, hey, there's this other component. Maybe we should look at the diamond instead, which is the hypocalcemia. So, um, Again, our patients are losing calcium because they're losing blood. Um, in addition to that, we're giving them blood. Mm -hmm. And red blood cells have a um, have citrate in them to decrease it from clotting. So it's what helps keep it stored. And citrate will bind to the patient's intrinsic calcium, which will ultimately bring their calcium lower. But calcium is such an important component and it plays a role in so many different functions within our body. So let's talk about some of those functions, okay? So number one, it's a huge component of the clotting cascade. So we need calcium in order to clot. Well, that goes back to our coagulopathy. Um, it also plays a role in vascular tone. So smooth muscle, as well as skeletal muscle, as well as cardiac tissue. So we have multiple things. So if we don't have great calcium, we could see arrhythmias. We could see poor contractility, which is going to contribute to lower cardiac output, less perfusion, acidosis, cycle, cycle, cycle. Um, but we also see that how it contributes to smooth muscle control. So if our patients can't vasoconstrict as the, you know, compensatory mechanism that is in place for hypovolemic shock, then that's a problem. Um, so again, how it all plays into all of that, as well as skeletal muscle. So if it's not, if they're not having really good skeletal muscle contraction, which is related to our breathing, then we could see things like hypercapnia, which again, acidosis, and how does that influence all the rest of it? So right. a super component, a super important component to start looking at. Mm -hmm. um, so what do we do? Well, usually in protocols associated, I know for our protocol that we have, um, we give calcium early on. And some of the literature is having some conversations around, do we start giving calcium even pre-hospital or before we even give a unit of blood? Like at what point do we give calcium? Um, because it does say that there is an increased risk of mortality associated with hypocalcemia, specifically ionized calcium is what we're going to be looking at. So replacing that um, calcium and, and trending the ionized calcium as well, because we don't want people to be hypercalcemic calcemic as well, which has also been associated with mortality. So it's kind of like that fine balance. So I think we're going to see more and more conversations about calcium because it plays such an important factor in many different physiological components of what happens in our body. Yeah. And I'll be honest, I've been a nurse for 20 years. When I started as a nurse, we didn't think a thing about calcium. Yeah. Like we dump a bunch of blood in and we're doing our best to resuscitate. And we're like, man, they just are not, they won't stop bleeding. Mm -hmm. They're just so cold. They just keep getting more acidotic because we did the trauma triad of death. Yeah. <laughs> but the more we talk about calcium and I can, I actually have seen it work in the moment. Mm -hmm. I went to an MTP in the ER. It's actually a GI bleed patient, but the patient went into arrhythmia and we gave calcium and I watched the arrhythmia correct itself after the calcium was in the patient. It was, it was actually, it was actually pretty cool. So yeah, calcium super important. But like you said, as we're giving these blood products, which the patient needs, the citrate in them just makes the calcium worse. Right. So it's like, well, you can't stop giving blood for the right. calcium. You have to just give them calcium. <laughs> right. Well, and the other issue with that is that our, our patients are bleeding, right? So we know what kind of shock do we have? Hypovolemic shock. Um, so they're in a hypoperfused state. So their liver is going to not be functioning 
optimally. And that could be related to the hypoperfusion or if they have an actual liver um, injury, that could also play a role into it. But your liver is what metabolizes citrate. So we already have, like, if we're giving additional citrate, which our liver can't metabolize, which means that we're going to be continuing to be hypocalcemic hypocalcemic, um, then, you know, it's again, just the cycle continues and continues. So typically we will give some type of calcium, whether that's calcium gluconate or calcium chloride, it just depends. Um, and how much as well, it depends on the protocol of what you have, but we definitely want to be taking that into consideration. Very good. All right. So what is the fourth component of the trauma diamond of death? Dun, dun, dun. So (laughs) acidosis. So again, why are we in an acidotic state? Well, hypovolemic shock, we're switching, switching from aerobic to anaerobic. Um, lactic acid is going to be produced. So we're going to be having some acidosis start happening. And acidosis will contribute directly to our clotting cascade. Um, and a bunch of different variable functions within our body, right? So not being able to clot again, which contributes to hypothermia, which contributes further progressing to acidosis. Um, And then we have calcium that indirectly plays a role in some of this as well. Yeah. So as you can see, just giving blood products is not the only piece of the answer. We're, We're balancing and juggling a lot of different aspects of the patient's care to make sure that we can actually get the bleed to stop. Yeah. It's not just putting pressure on it or sitting to the OR. There's a lot more to manage as, mm-hmm. as a trauma nurse. So Sarah, when thinking back about this patient, you know, you gave him all that MTP. I'm mm-hmm. sure you're constantly checking his lab values, yes. his tag, his calcium, his electrolytes, because uh, there's a lot going on with this patient. A lot. What do you feel like are the primary takeaways that you would want a nurse to have when caring for someone who, say, is a GSW? So... I think you have to have a good understanding of that triad, the yeah. triad or the diamond, right? Mm-hmm. So you have to understand how all of it works together. And not only, like you said, we're not just going to be stopping the bleed and dumping products in. We want to be able to look at those components individually mm-hmm. so we can help support our patients individually with those components to eventually stop it collectively with the bleeding itself. So paying attention to your labs, right? Mm-hmm. Trending your labs, you have to turn your labs. You got to know what's going on. Um, H and H, tag, calcium, even potassium, because blood products can. <laughs> yeah, that'll contribute to it. Um, obviously, monitoring your patients perfusion state. So Mm -hmm. how can we support them? Yes, we're going to be giving them, resuscitating them with volume, but they may also need some vasopressors, some vasoactive medications to help them. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that we are addressing their temperature. So making sure that they're warm. So we are addressing that hypothermia. Right. Just because you're sweating like crazy doesn't mean your patient is warm. (laughs) Yes. And you might be sweating because these patients uh, can be a lot. And so you may be sweating, but you know, they're in a, they're in a shock state. Um, And then continuing to just monitor for any additional bleeding and replacing that volume and being being very cognizant of the whole picture so not just isolated things you have to really take all of it into consideration when you're dealing with these patients perfect well sarah i think you summed it up pretty good thank you (laughs) um so i will say you if you're a trauma nurse you're probably very familiar with the trauma triad of death but i think in the coming months years you're going to see a lot more literature supporting this diamond as we figure out all the connections like we're we're slowly starting to get more information about it um but yeah i think i think the next update of tncc is probably going to have a diamond but you know don't don't quote me on that yeah we'll (laughs) we'll we'll have to see there has to be some more like they're looking at it to see you know the the uh, nuances and the details associated with it so but fascinating topic, Sarah. Thanks for breaking it down. Oh, I love for making about it make it. sense. Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. All right. Thank you so much. Yes. Thanks for having me. Bye, guys. Bye.